So I uh, was noticing this video you made about the genetic algorithms, and uh, I, uh, I posted something in your comments, and I wanted to see some if you could help me out or if any of your uh, viewers might be able to help me out. So I'm a person that's mainly in, uh, into biology and biochemistry, so my background is a little bit... Uh, um, <clears throat> I'm not too uh, well versed in uh, computer programming, but I'm trying to learn some coding right now. But uh, what I wanted to do was uh, see if I could reach out to people like yourself, see if they could help me out with something I was interested in using that, the genetic algorithms for. So this was um, an interesting uh, idea, because you know you talk about the, uh, the use of the algorithms to um, you know, using the algorithm to like compile things. You know, the, the computer is such a superior machine compared to the human brain, and especially with with the phenomenons like you know Moore's law and exponential um, computing power. You know, the thinking, the processing ability of computers to run codes and run uh, information is just you know just getting better and better and better. So I think you know, it's, it, and especially with applications like OpenCV, image recognition, and you know, all this stuff that I know you probably heard about. Um, you know, one thing I was interested in doing was uh, seeing my, my background is in, in biochemistry, and, and I wanted to uh, see how, how well a genetic algorithm could actually compile or bring together a hypothesized, you know, like, a, like an educated guess, you know, like an actual hypothesis of a genome for an organism simply based on the organism's uh, phenotype. You know, and you probably know by now that the phenotype is the, uh, uh, the, the expression of the genes. So ever since the, uh, you know, ever since the, the, the discovery of the of DNA, we've always been going from genotype from the gene, the genome, and then we um, Basically, can it, we, we see nature express those genes into a phenotype, which is the appearance of the uh, the organism, the animal, whatever it is. And in this case, I wanted to do it in reverse. You know, I wanted to see is there a way to actually have a computer compile or hypothesize something based on simply the appearance of the organism or the animal and then go backwards and say, all right, this is what I think the genotype would look like to match that phenotype, whether it be limbs, you know, a face, or arms, legs, fur, scales, whatever thing you want to have in the animal. So, you know, I start out with, um, animal I was talking about was this one. This is really interesting. <coughs> And the Leoplorodon, there you go, that's the way you spell it. And this is an interesting uh, uh, thing I wanted to talk about. The Leoplorodon, it's um, an extinct uh, reptile from the ocean, you know, from the, uh, I'd say, in the Middle Jurassic period. And it, it belongs to the Pliosaur um, family of marine uh, reptiles. So, all we essentially have left of this organism is the, uh, the actual phenotype. You go over to images of this animal, you're going to start seeing uh, the images here, like you'll see like the, uh, what the, what the hypothesize, what, what paleontologists probably believe what it looked like, and what, you know, they maybe helped some of the designers, the artists, to kind of paint what it looked like. And I think it'd be interesting if, if a genetic algorithm was able to basically uh, piece together what a hypothesized <clears throat> DNA strand would look like for an animal like this. You know, starting from whatever type of DNA would code this type of, of limb, 
or that type of uh, snout or face type of thing, you know, these phenotypes, um, especially for something that's never been, you know, that we don't even have a, a phylogenetic record of, you know, which is the ancestral uh, record, you know, the, the actual uh, a divert, uh, a transitional form or something that could lead us to more evidence of it, you know, a phylogenetic uh, record. We don't really have one. We don't have anything, you know, a closest relative or something like that to go by. So it'd be interesting to see if the DNA algorithm could start out by trying to piece together that type of thing. Um, one thing I also wanted to keep in mind was this that, um, I'll go back here. Um, so this was another thing that really got me going with the uh, with this idea because we're talking about some some structures in, in biology that are pretty common that we could maybe start out from and um, here is the uh, the notochord. So the, the notochord is seen in all all vertebrae embryos and chordate embryos, you know, the animals with the backbones. And um, whether they are, are they, you know, in this diagram you have the human, the reptiles, and the birds and the fish. They all have that notochord, and they all have the gill slits. So they have. We already have some structures that are common in these in basically all animals with a backbone, including this one. Yeah, including the Liplorodon, because Liplorodon had a, it was a chordate. It's pretty clear that the animal is a chordate. And it's pretty clear that the animal had a, what do we got here, the skeleton. It's pretty clear that the animal had vertebrae. And then, you know, the structure was the vertebrae starts here, and then you got the tail, and this is the nervous uh, system is kind of uh, branching into that brain, but it kind of starts uh, radiating out into nerves and stuff like that in the muscle system, and you can see how the vertebrae would have ran all the way back here, wherever that, like, that stem or brain, I don't know about all the anatomical terms, but right here it would have gone all the way down. Essentially, this um, structure right here of the notochord, this is a human one, but it's like a reptilian one, but you know, essentially they all look very similar at this stage. Uh, they all had probably very similar DNA to, to code. Notice how I'm talking about code. You know, this is a computer science issue. This is not a biological issue. The biology is no longer just a science of uh, science unto itself. It's becoming very rapidly uh, of an information science. So it's kind of in your area of expertise now. No longer in people that are majoring in biology and biochemistry. That, that, that's not going to really uh, crack the frontiers of the science. The frontier of science in biology now is computers. It's big genomic data, analytic data, you know, the algorithms, AI, things like IBM Watson and stuff, analyzing cancer cells and genomes and stuff like that. I mean, that's all it's all becoming information science, it's all becoming part of coding. And I think that whatever genes create these uh, structures here, um, they're very similar in all chordates. You could technically start maybe with a single set of genes that code the chordate, uh, the, the notochord, uh, code the, um, the gill slits and kind of get a basic embryo started for a chordate embryo, probably a reptilian one because we're talking about a little pleurodon here, which was more reptilian looking, even though it's a pleosaur. Um, and we know that probably pleosaurs, I think there's some theories that they may have uh, been relatives of reptiles that had gone on land, left the oceans, and then they returned to the oceans and then they evolved these flipper, uh, these paddle like limbs. Um, but essentially, you know, that the, they're. Their genetic, their phylo um, tree, phylogenetic tree is just gone from the fossil record. Basically, all we have is um, stuff like that left. So we know that there was a structure and function for this. And if the the DNA could um,
code something like a noto chord, which eventually turned into something like that, and then the gill slits which kind of disappeared and uh, you know gave rise to whatever other thing, other DNA, uh, other genes were activated during embryolic, embryonic development, gave rise to these types of uh, structures. You know, I'm pretty sure that a, a genetic algorithm, given enough time, you know, time, it's going to take some time because obviously the, the algorithm just keeps gathering more and more data, right? That's what it sounds like in what your videos say. And the more information is fed to them, the, the algorithms, the more that they have to, to add into. So I would think whatever genes are encoded here for the, for, uh, for the nodal cord um, could be used as kind of like a starting point for a, uh, a Liploridon uh, bioinformatics uh, pipeline. You know, essentially starting out, kind of like what bioinformatics does, bioinformatics is compiling uh, you know, massive amounts of uh, genomic data for plants and animals, and also macromolecules like uh, not only uh, nucleic acids, but things like uh, proteins and carbohydrates. They have like proteomics for proteins. And you know, it'd be interesting if we if uh, the DNA was able to give us, if the algorithm was able to give us a hypothetical karyotype, you know, a karyotype that would, um, let's see what the, uh, yeah, like a hypothetical karyotype for that organism. And I don't think the karyotype has to be that big or, or small. You know, this is the human karyotype, but it's just 22. 22 uh, chromosomes is 23. That's the 23rd one, I guess, right there is female and male. Um, you know, uh, well, this is probably for one of the sets of the genes because there's 46 in all humans, but 23 per uh, sperm and egg. But essentially, I think, you know, like when you look at karyotypes, um, a lot of the animals in the, in, the, in the animal kingdom, they have like, you know, there's bacteria, I think, that have like uh, a couple thousand, you know, versus, um, Yeah, there was, uh, I think it was this wiki article here that talked about, like, elephants had, like, a, 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 there's, like, bacteria that have, like, several thousand number of chromosomes in a set. Is it this one? There was one that had um, a number of karyotype by animal. And I thought I saw something like about, you know, like some of the bacteria and stuff, they had like several thousand uh, sets of genes. Um, elephants had like 30-something, I think, you know, like, uh, or I, I have to check that out. So I guess what I'm trying to get to is to say that the size of the animal doesn't necessarily dictate uh, maybe the, the number of genes that the animal would have. So I thought that that was interesting, I, but I don't know if that's really re relevant here. I mean, a karyotype can be anything. It can be whatever we decide it to be, um, because this is like a hypothetical deal here. You know, we're we're doing, we're 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 making a, a synthetically based organism that is in our own image of what it probably closestly resembled that. You know, and if it means that you start out with just a notochord. Um, the nodal cord would have a set amount of genes, um, and it starts, you know, it goes from, I think it's the, the, the initial uh, collection of cells would be like the blastocyte, I think. Um, and then from there it goes on to a embryo. I, 
I don't know all the steps in embryology, but I know that you know that there's going to in terms of the G DNA, you know, it kind of starts out with that, those chromosomes and certain ones turn on and off. But I'm just interested in knowing um, if an algorithm could start compiling that sort of thing, um, and how to actually get the um, the original, you know, the first base pairs of DNA to start coding. Um, this like, you know, educated guess, like a hypothetical guess of a, of a genome. It's not going to be like 100% exactly what we would see in, in an animal, but it would be something similar. But that would be the challenge. I mean, the, the algorithm would have to start going from this developmental stage and then seeing how is it going to start, what genes are going to be packaged inside this the, the actual uh, cells, the actual two gametes, the sperm and the egg, hypothetically, you know, um, that would start giving rise to these types of uh, phenotypic, uh, you know, like uh, expressions of the genome, because these things haven't been seen in any genetic record. Hmm. So, so long, you know, so it's like it's really tough to really go ahead and start saying, you know, oh, this thing had like a thing that looks like a crocodile or it had like a snake like um, thing or whatever. You know, if dinosaurs came from birds, so with dinosaurs, it's easier. I think this is a much more of a an interesting uh, problem to solve because it would prove that the genetic algorithm can learn and it can begin to start um, going from this what this image of this animal looks like and start saying well technically based on what that looks like it probably would have had these set of genes to code this sort of phenotypic characteristic because we can already do like um, what was it here there was another article here this is what kind of inspired me to do it too it was a genome to face isn't that one genome the face article? Yeah, like there's some YouTube videos about that. How um, um, like there's algorithms now that they use to uh, generate a, a face from the DNA. What if that could be reversed? What if the the, the actual algorithm could be um, go backwards, like, you know, like reverse, like saying you start with the actual image and then you start, you get a DNA sequence from the image. So that would be kind of neat, you know, and I, I don't know how, what type of uh, approach you would take with this with the algorithm. Um, but, uh, but essentially we already have something to go by. You know, in terms of, uh, I think, you know, because from what I've learned in some of the coding, you need variables, right? You need data to input into the, or you need to classify, like, uh, okay, with object-oriented programming, you need to, like, have certain um, things that are going to remain constant throughout the entire program. And, you know, some of the things that are going to remain constant are this, like, you know, the, the, the carrier, the, 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 the carrier type, but what is going to be uh, the thing that remains constant in all organisms in the planet with backbones that we see now? And it's this, these, these notochords and these gill slits and um, you know, these little extra details that the embryos have. It's, um, it's something that you could use in an algorithm to start getting to steps like this, to say, okay, if this, if the, the light pleurodon probably started out in a similar like structure, you know, it's only a couple hundred million years of evolution. It's not much of a difference in terms of embryology and what DNA looked like. I mean, they all had backbones. I mean, it, it's probably, if it had a backbone, it probably 99% looks something similar to what this looks like, you know. At embryo embryonic stage, but then there's some other genes in here that are beginning to turn on from whatever karyotype it had. That's uh, expressing these these details here, and then you know, like 
Yeah, I mean, I know there's a lot more to that because, you know, this is more of an evolutionary um, <clears throat> adaptation for whatever reason the structure and function of this animal uh, evolved to do. But I, I'm more interested in just seeing how we could actually um, get the, the phenotypic. I, I don't care about the, the the evolutionary aspect. Like, why did this thing have uh, paddle-like limbs and the snout was like that and the teeth kind of protrude out like that or whatever? I don't care. It doesn't matter to me. What matters to me is seeing can we reproduce this in a current, in a, in a living life form today, kind of like going gene by gene by gene that we choose um, or that the algorithm would choose that would actually kind of reflect that, sort of express this type of phenotypic characteristic. So that's kind of my coding project that I've always been interested in. Um, and I call it like predictive genetics. So it would essentially, I guess, we would be creating a, a predictive genetic algorithm. It's predicting genetic uh, genomes, genomic codes, just based on an image, you know, and uh, something that what what an animal looks like, what its structure and function probably looked like, what it probably did in nature, opposed to what the DNA um, was. You know, like, because a lot of the DNA that we have um, is not really used in the actual appearance of the animal. The animal may have had a lot of other things that were um, hidden. You know, they're just kind of like, these are not phenotypic characteristics. They're just kind of things that are in the genotype that are important for the animal's life. But phenotypically, in terms of its appearance, a lot, a lot of the genes weren't even really used for that. You know, they don't express phenotype. Most of your genes in humans and in most other animals, they express like you know hormone regulation and you know uh, biochemical processes and cellular processes and division and uh, things like that, regulating cells and stuff like that. They're not, you know, and, and things. Are, uh, if, if the animal is going to have an issue with uh, developing some sort of cancer or the organism is going to have some sort of uh, problem with some sort of gene expression or hereditary problem, those are all mainly what the genome does. The genome, very little of it is going to start expressing stuff like this. This is a really small percentage of your genome, of an animal, of an organism's genome, a eukaryotic organism like a like Pluridon or a human or anything with a backbone. Um, so that's interesting. I don't know how we could um, do that. So I commented on your videos, so I thought that'd be interesting to kind of throw that out. Maybe anybody else that's interested in this sort of thing um, to see how we can combine, you know, algorithms with uh, actual organisms that uh, don't even that, that, that we have no, we've never had a DNA uh, bioinformatics pipeline for, but we could maybe see if the the, the actual algorithm could code it and. Um, and who knows? I mean, nowadays you have, um, what was it? There was another radar. What was the last thing I'm going to talk about? I'm going, to, going over my time. Uh, here it is. So, this company right here, Cambrian Genomics, um, what they do is they, uh, they print out DNA. And you can bring them, apparently, they have a website that prints out the DNA. Um, see, it says, uh, Cambrian Genomics makes the first hardware systems for laser printing DNA. So you could print DNA. And that would be interesting to see if uh, one of these uh, databases ever got to a certain extent where we could actually print out the actual uh, DNA, a full karyotype of DNA, inject it into a, uh, an actual cell, and uh, introduce it in vitro and see if you can actually bring a synthetic life form just like this and give it birth. That would be a major milestone in synthetic biology. So it would be kind of like combining uh, genomic, big data genomics and actually creating synthetic life with it. Um, that's already something that um, Craig, Craig, what's his name, um, Venture. Yeah, he, he's done some great stuff.
Craig Vetner. He's done some great stuff. You know, when I was growing up um, and I was learning about biology and chemistry and stuff like that, I, I was always so uh, amazed by Craig Vetner and his stuff that he did with the Human Genome Project. Um, but he's basically involved in that in a project, yeah, that did uh, do synthetic uh, synthetic cell, and um, you know they were able to combine different genes into it and make whatever they wanted with it. But you know this is essentially kind of science fiction at this point. But I think that this, I don't think that that's necessarily science fiction. Actually, just making up a hypothetical genome for an animal that we th and, and it seemed if the genome would have exp uh, corresponded with the actual phenotypic characteristics. So, yeah, I appreciate your uh, your your videos. Um, they're well done, and I hope um, a lot of people give me ideas with um, with the feedback in my video. Okay, thanks.